everything is downhill from lead generation. If you don't have systems in place to constantly get new leads, so whether it's your online advertising you're doing, whether it's email campaigns, whether you're out in the community doing lunch and learns or doing dinners or doing screenings or having makeovers, whatever that is, there has to be a steady flow of lead generation. So these events need to be in place. And unfortunately, what happens in many people that I discuss with, many chiropractors I talk to, are very reactive when it comes to lead generation. And they look at their past month and they say, gosh, our new patients were down. We better put some systems in place to get more leads. You know, so these are things we need to think about in advance and be very proactive about is having these things in place future in the future so that we can predict, you know, exactly what's going to happen as far as our lead generation. So we're constantly attracting a certain number of leads every month. And we can calculate based on, you know, history, how many of those leads are actually going to come into the office as new patients, what our conversion rates are, so we know how many people are going to be starting under chiropractic care, and we can predict whether we're going to grow, whether we're going to stay the same, or whether our numbers are going to drop. It's a very, very simple way of calculating how successful your business is going to go. So that's the number one thing, is have these strategies for lead generation. So if I'm buying a practice, that's one of my first questions is what is this practice doing to generate leads? Number two, uh, systems in place for lead conversion. So, you know, I, I, I unfortunately I have the, the privilege and opportunity to talk to so many chiropractors. And I say unfortunately because so many chiropractors that I speak to don't have systems in place to create, educate, and sustain good wellness patients. And so I can go into a practice and one of my first questions is, what is your day one procedure? And it's amazing how many practices, how many doctors still adjust people on their first visit. Well, unfortunately, that's such a demeaning way to express chiropractic to somebody when they come in with a symptom. And I know sometimes, especially young docs, we're so hungry to get our hands on people and we want to care for them. We want to help them. But we we put them into this model where we demean ourselves similar to something like a massage therapist where we would provide some sort of quote unquote treatment on the first visit and it just doesn't make sense so we have to have the systems in place to receive those people to educate those people and a process in place to assess them and give them a specific plan of management, not just to address their symptom, but to get to the root cause of the problem. So as a buyer of a practice, that's one of the things that I'm going to really try to find out is what systems are in place with the entire team, what scripting do they have, what procedures do they use, what objective measurements do they use on day one or day two on the re-exam process, to measure subluxation, to measure nerve interference, and make sure that everybody understands, you know, where this patient is going and what we're delivering in our office. So that's number two, lead conversion. Number three, is there a high amount of recurring revenue in the practice? So these are things that I want to know. Uh, you know, it, how many of those patients, and this again goes back to our LTV, how many of those patients are continuing to come in on a regular basis after their symptoms are gone? So a high retention practice holds incredible value because all of a sudden now you've got these patients in your office that you've built over time that understand why they're coming in, that understand exactly what they're, what they're getting in their office and why they should be there on a regular basis regardless of what symptomatic presentation they have, or even with the exception of symptoms, you know, so they're coming in on a regular basis just to stay well. So is there a high amount of recurring revenue, maintenance patients in your practice? And here's the, the really cool thing is that now a practice that has a huge following of maintenance or wellness-based patients is independent of lead generation now. You can thrive for a long time without having a lot of uh, new leads coming in because these patients just keep coming in and they add to your monthly recurring revenue. The fourth thing, uh, if I was buying a practice, is the physical space of the practice limiting the growth? So often what we would do as a team is we would take our team out to the, to basically to the sidewalk of the building and we had our own building 
and we would do a walkthrough. We would walk up the driveway. We'd look at the parking. We would look at, uh, you know, the entrance. Is the sidewalk okay? Is it safe for people, especially if there were people that were incapacitated? Are they able to get in? We, we specifically put in a, a ramp for people that couldn't walk up the stairs properly, or if they were incapacitated with a walker or a wheelchair, they were able to get into the building. Is the front entrance welcoming? Is there areas for coats and for boots and things like that? We want to make sure that there's benches for people to take their boots on and off. So we were cognizantly thinking, what is the flow that happens when people come into our office? And is it conducive for the number or the volume of people that we want to see? So these are things that we really want to make sure that are happening properly in a regular you know, a regular routine in our office to make sure that our office is able to accommodate those types of people. Can we have a doctor's report that's, you know, double digits of people, 10, 12, 15, or 20 people in our doctor's report? Do we have the capacity for that? During the busy times of the day, like maybe it's first thing in the morning or at the end of the day when the majority of people are off work or, or children get out of school, that's going to be our busier times. And we may have, you know, 30 people, 40 people in the office at the same time. Are we able to accommodate those type of, uh, of people or those types of numbers of people at the same time? So these are all things that we went through on our walkthrough through the office just to make sure that our capacity was fine. Are our washroom facilities good and accommodating for people? Are they welcoming for people, you know? Or, you know, we look at the cleanliness of our office. So check the physical capacity of your office, check the physical appearance of your office, and make sure it's conducive for what you're trying to deliver. The fifth thing, your overall database. You know, for anybody who's been in practice for any length of time, you have a number of patients who are no longer coming in actively in the office. Let's be honest. I mean, not everybody's going to stay for the rest of their life for chiropractic wellness care. So, so there's a number of patients. If you've been in practice for five or 10 years or more, you have a lot of people. Like there's probably thousands of people that are no longer coming into your office. Well, the question is, if I'm buying your practice or if you're the buyer of your practice, are you still in communication with those people on some level? So do you have a regular newsletter campaign or do you have a regular email campaign just to share information with those people, to share valuable health tips or nutrition tips or staying well tips or um, tips on different medication side effects, whatever that may be, but just a way to constantly fill their inbox or even text or SMS messages about certain events in your office there are campaigns that you can set up just to be in touch with these people. If you have a special event coming up in your office, like a dinner or a workshop, why not send a message out to all those old patients that haven't been in for six months or a year or longer and invite them out to the workshop? It may be a great way to start the reactivation process for all these people. So I want to know if I'm buying a practice, are these things in place? And if they're not in place, listen, send me a DM and I can help you get that set up. It's really easy to do. So that's the next thing. Uh, and we, we say this, you know, we want to accumulate your list. And there's something in business that we call NAP, N-A-P, name, address, phone number. So name, email address, and phone number is a great way. And if, if you're not collecting, you know, obviously email addresses, and I'm sure you're collecting names and phone numbers for those new patients, but collect email address because it's a great way to communicate with people over the long term as well. The next thing, number six, how many non-doctor revenue streams are there in the office? So here's the thing. So most practices are completely dependent on the doctor being there to gain revenue. You know, you are your main source of income. And if you're your main source of income, and I want you to think about this, if you're your main source of income in your office, you have not created a business in your office, right? You've created a job. That's essentially what you have. So if you've built a practice where you are the main source of income and the only reason that practice is making money is when you show up and you deliver chiropractic care to patients and they pay you, and that's the number one source of income, you've just created a job. That's all you've created. And unfortunately, that job doesn't even have benefits because if you take time off, there's no income. Uh, if you get sick or injured, there's no income. So you know, for us to be influential people in our community, for us to get people under our following and for us to advance the profession, we need to create a business. We need to think of our practice like a business so that it becomes highly 
independent of us being the main source of income or even us being there. So we got to start thinking of business people. And if I'm, again, if I'm buying a practice, I want to know, is that practice uh, sustained by alternative sources of income other than the doctor? And here's the big thing is that, you know, if you have a practice that can run itself regardless of you being the main doctor in that office, maybe you have associates or maybe you have all kinds of extra income streams. Maybe it's nutrition or maybe it's other modalities that are not necessarily required to have a doctor provide them. So uh, these things can be very valuable to the overall value of a practice because what happens is now you open up the door. Let's say you're selling your practice. You open up the door to buyers who may not be chiropractors. There may be independent investors or business people that want to buy your practice who are not a chiropractor who can run that practice like a business because you've set it up with these uh, external sources of income that are not doctor dependent. So again, this again just creates huge value for your practice. Number seven. Is there an upsell package? So again, you have, and we talked about this last week, you'll have patients in your office that love you. They will follow everything. They, if you have a dinner, they're coming to the dinner. If you have an advanced talk, they're going to show up. If you do a makeover, they're in the front row. They will follow you because they trust you. They love what you stand for. They've captured your vision and they're following that vision and they they look at you as the influential leader in their life. You all have patients like that. And the more patients that you have like that, the better off that you are because those patients will, if you implement a new program in your office, maybe it's a nutrition program, maybe it's a nutrition program with a monthly recurring uh, auto ship, you know, for those patients, they'll be the ones that purchase that. So stacking these plans together, whether it's a service of mo some sort of a modality in your office, massage therapy, maybe you have a physiotherapist that comes in that provides some extra service, whatever that is, those are the patients that are going to say, yes, I want part of that. I want to be involved in that because they trust you, they feel value in what you're delivering. And so it's really important as a business person to have these packages where those patients can add their services together. And maybe they get some sort of a discount. Maybe it's a stacked care plan. But if you don't have them in place, it'll never happen. So think about how you can start to stack those care plans together and provide some sort of a benefit for people who want all of the services that you provide in your office. Number eight, number eight, your team. So here's a big thing. This is such an important thing. If, if you were going to buy your practice, again, the, one of the things you'd want to do is interview the team. If I was coming to buy your practice, I would want to interview the team. I would want to interview them together. I would want to interview them separately. So it's really important that that team be engaged in exactly what it is you're doing. So first of all, can they articulate what it is they're doing? Can they articulate their role in your office and the vision of you, the vision of your office, what your office stands for. Can they articulate why your office is different? It's so vital that your team can actually verbalize what do we do different in this office than chiropractors across town, than chiropractors in any other location. Why should people travel an hour or two hours to come and see us when they could easily go to a chiropractor down the street close to where they live? So that's really important. Are your team engaged and receiving care like your patients receive care? So in other words, have your team had regular examinations or x-rays or whatever it is you use to examine people? Posture checks, bilateral scales, have they had an insight scan and do they get those regularly? Are they set up for a re-exam? And between the examination and the re-examination, are they on a course of care? Do they understand the care plan? Do you provide care as a benefit for your team, or do they pay a little bit out of out of their pocket to do that? You know, to create some value. Um, we always made sure that they knew that their health benefits of working in our office were their chiropractic care for them and their immediate family. So there's another question: Is your team members' immediate family under care? And if they're not, it's a sign to you that they fully don't understand what it is you do. 
So these are all conversations to have with your team. So if I'm buying your practice, these are questions I'm asking your team. Is your children, you know, are your children under care? Is your spouse under care? Is your immediate family under care? Are they on care plans where they're coming in regularly? Or if they do get adjusted, do they just show up randomly? So I want to know if your delivery of chiropractic is so intent and your team is so committed to the mission and the vision that they have fully bought into that mission and vision. Because again, that adds value to your practice. Uh, oh, here's the other thing. You know, is your, if you sell products in your office, nutritional supplements or home care kits, does your team use them? Does your team buy vitamins from your office? Maybe they buy them at a discount, but do they use the things that you sell? Again, that shows that they're fully invested into what you're delivering. And maybe if they're if they're going to Walmart and buying their supplements there, you might have to ask, you know, what what is the disconnect? Why is this happening? So these are all good questions to to have. Number nine, are there community partnerships in place? So again, if I'm buying a practice. If you're buying your own practice, how many community partnerships have you created in your community? So in other words, how many companies have you reached out to to do a lunch and learn to? Are you the company chiropractor for these companies with large number of employees? Do you actively go in there? Maybe you do ergonomic assessments at their desk. Maybe you do nutritional talks for them. You know, maybe you will go in and do screenings in the company. But if you've created these partnerships, maybe it's a gym, uh, it's a church, um, schools where you go into a school and do screenings or scoliosis screenings for kids. There's all these possibilities for partnerships, sports teams, where you can become the chiropractor for a sports team where you're volunteering your time. If I'm coming in to look at the value of a practice and I see that there's all these community partnerships in place, I get really excited and say that there's a lot of value there in this practice because it has gained a good reputation, it's gained a name, it's got these partnerships in place, and that is a steady flow of the ability to go out and share the message of chiropractic with people. Uh, so that is number nine. And number 10, is the online presence of this office strong? And here's a big thing. This is so huge, guys. You know, we're living in the online world now. This is where people find you. So let's be honest. You know, whether you're doing any type of online marketing, whether it's Google ads or Facebook ads, uh, you know, if you're doing email marketing, a new patient, when they see your ad and make the decision to, you know, explore what you deliver in your office, or maybe you've attracted them by some sort of an ad saying, okay, I'd like to maybe explore this. They're not even searching for you in this case. What are they going to do? They're going to look you up. They're going to check out your website. They're going to go to Google and see, you know, your reviews and your rankings and all this. So it's really important that you have a strong online presence. If you don't have a strong online presence, you are missing out and it's detracting from the value of your practice. So again, if I'm looking to buy a practice, I'm looking at what type of online presence does this practice have? So do you post regularly on social media? And if you don't do it yourself as a doctor, which ideally, if you're busy enough, you shouldn't be doing or shouldn't have the time to do it. Have you dedicated a staff member or have you hired somebody that's outside your office? Maybe it's a patient or maybe it's a, somebody's child. Maybe it's one of the staff's teenage children and you pay them a couple hours a week to post on social media regularly. Give them some content and they post it. There's all kinds of ways to do this. Are you collecting reviews? Are you collecting video testimonials and posting those to your website or to a blog? Writing re you know, regular blogs for your SEO uh, you know, SEO person who's doing your SEO services to rank you higher in those map rankings? Um, and do you have regular email campaigns where you're reaching out to people and constantly in touch with people? These are all things that are really important. Here's another big thing. When you talk about reviews is that have a system in place to respond to those reviews for a few reasons, because if you're collecting reviews in your office, that's great. The number of reviews you get will help your Google rankings. Google will rank you on the number of reviews that you have. They'll also rank you on the quality of those reviews. So perhaps you can put a, sim uh, a system in to filter those reviews where you're only collecting four and five star reviews. You're still able to respond to reviews that are less than four star and acknowledge that and ask the person what, you know, why they had a not so good experience in your office and obviously rectify that. 
and that's really important, but those won't be published to Google. So there's ways to do that as well. But here's the biggest thing is having a system in place to respond to every single review because a few things. Number one, patients that are searching you out will look at the reviews and they'll look at the responses of those reviews because it shows integrity on your part. Number one, you're, you're thanking people who have made a review for you. Number two is that you're acknowledging that review, even if it is a bad review and outside people who are checking you out want to see how you interact with people with reviews. But here's the, the biggest thing. Number three is that Google will not only rank you on the number of reviews, the quality of reviews, they'll rank you on your responses. So if you have a system to have responses to 100% of your reviews, immediately your rankings go up in Google and you'll rank higher in the map for, for organic searches. When somebody searches chiropractor near me, you show up at the top. These are things that I'm looking for in, in the value of a practice. So, you know, as we start to go through the rest of this year, look at ways that increase the value of what you're delivering for chiropractic care in your community. So look at these top 10 lists here for the reasons why you're not reaching your goals, start to rectify them. You know, you're not converting enough leads. You're not gaining enough leads, whatever that is, train with your team, make sure that you put these things in place because I guarantee you, if, if you are not reaching your goals, there's one of these 10 things at least that are not in place on a regular basis. And once you start addressing them and put everything together and have a routine of addressing them regularly, your practice and your business can't help but thrive. You become more influential, you see more people, you create more of a following, and guess what happens to your bank account? You gain incredible wealth. And when you gain incredible wealth, you can advance the profession because you have now you have big influence on the profession.